Okay, let's talk Pixar. Can you think of any Pixar movies? To me, I don't know if it was the first one, uh, but I certainly think of Toy Story as maybe the quintessential Pixar movie, and I think maybe it was one of the first ones. Uh, do you know Toy Story? Uh, can you think of any characters in Toy Story uh, or how the plot of that works? Um, if you think of Buzz Lightyear, uh, who is voiced by Tim Allen, uh, he's the space ranger in Toy Story, uh, you can probably picture him to infinity and beyond. If you picture that, if you know Pixar, if you can think of the movie Toy Story, then you know that the plot of that movie basically revolves around Buzz. He's sort of the character whose ambitions drive the plot. Can you remember it? His idea is that he is not a toy, but he's a space ranger. He's literally a legit space ranger, not a toy. Um, although, you know, in the movie, he still lays down when Andy's coming or when an adult is coming, which is only what toys do. Uh, so maybe he's got some like uh, identity issues or something. Uh, but as far as that goes, Buzz thinks that he's too good to be uh, a toy. He doesn't think he belongs in with Woody and uh, Etch-a-Sketch and the dinosaur, whatever its name is, and the slinky dog and all the other uh, pets, uh, animals toys, you know, doesn't belong in with all the other toys. So, uh, think about Buzz and think about that. Quintessential Pixar movie? I think so. Uh, Buzz's storyline is really the one that drives that movie and gets the plot moving, right? Yeah, can you remember that? Good morning, good afternoon, welcome to Preparing for Sunday, where you and I take a look together at the upcoming Sunday's scripture text. This is for Sunday, August 13th, 2023 we are now to the 11th Sunday after Pentecost and the prescribed reading for year A uh, lectionary cycle A uh, of the 11th Sunday after Pentecost is if you do all the math Matthew 14 verses 22 through 33 so uh, as way of entering into what I've been talking about with this Gospel of Matthew basically all year as we've been in this is that this is not a discourse. We were out of a discourse last week, and we continue in the 14th chapter of Matthew to be after uh, the third discourse. We are not in a great discourse of Jesus inside of Matthew. Chapter 13 is the parable discourse. We're now in 14, and this has the narrative telling of several events, miracles in Jesus' uh, ministry, and we're not in a discourse where Jesus is giving a prolonged speech. We're before the fourth discourse. We're in between the two. And we're in the 14th chapter of Matthew. It's verses 22 and, 20 and through 33 for this Sunday. And what's important here is that immediately, and that should uh, strike a little bit. Uh, I want you to hear that word immediately. Uh, immediately after the feeding of the 5,000 in verse 22, in 1422, immediately. Uh, which means it's on the heels of that feeding, Jesus commands the disciples to get into a boat and go over to the other side. And again, this is narrative. This is not Jesus sitting down with all the crowds and you and I, like how we do in church where we sit in the pews and hear the gospel. This is not that. This is activity. This is Jesus uh, in, in action and in, in, in the storytelling of some of the things Jesus did. The immediately has to get your attention here. Uh, and I'll give you some, some uh, biblical sort of insight as to how that sort of works. Um, I say it a lot in these preparings. I say it in church. Uh, you know, I, I am a narrative uh, sort of person. I like the storytelling techniques of the Gospels, and that's what I spend a lot of my time thinking about when I read these. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we have quite a bit of evidence that Mark was the first Gospel written. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's the first sort of genre of a gospel or almost like a biography kind of ever written in history. Mark was very innovative in the writing of his gospel and did a lot with his uh, writing that, as far as we can tell, uh, never really was done before. Mark really came up with an idea of this gospel, and uh, Mark was the first. Mark has a lot of uh, this technique inside of it. Mark does. There's not the discourses, 
but it's a lot of stories about Jesus, and they're stuck together with this word immediately. Uh, I don't remember, but I think it's like 40 plus times that Mark uses that word immediately, or the Greek word for that, immediately. Matthew was written after Mark. Matthew, Luke, and John were all written after. Uh, Luke and Matthew are similar to Mark. They tell the story with the same structure. They have a lot of ideas from Mark that carry over almost word for word sometimes. And uh, here's a vestige of that. Uh, Matthew almost wipes out all the immediately's from Mark, but here's one that he didn't wipe out. And so that, that always, you know, when you're a narrative person, that gets your attention here. Right on the heels of the previous one, uh, and then we know that this story is also in Mark, and it's also in Luke, uh, of the calming of the seas, which is the story for this week. And Matthew has taken it over in a lot of ways from Mark, and we can get that trigger by him keeping that word immediately. Matthew likes to clean up Mark, change it, make Jesus' talks go into discourses instead of be spread out throughout the book. Uh, Matthew likes to do things to, to sort of uh, take Mark's idea and then go further with it. Here we get uh, a carryover, and, and that word immediately reminds me of Mark. All right, so I'm going to be talking a lot in the next few minutes about Matthew and Mark and how this story sits together in the two of them. Before I go too far with that, there's this thing I've been saying for weeks about the more strongly Jewish or Hebrew nature of Matthew. The idea that he would have five discourses to offset the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, already kind of a Jewish idea. That he would start and Matthew would have this uh, lineage of Jesus as it comes down through uh, Joseph. That's a very uh, Hebrew way coming through the paternal line. That he wants to track that as very Jewish. I can go on and on about the Jewishness of Matthew and how it intensifies the Jewishness of the Gospel of Mark. Here's a place where that happens. The story of the calming of the sea is, in general, uh, drawing on some Jewish and religious history, okay? So if you remember all the way back into Genesis with Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, and uh, in the garden, uh, partly what happens when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is they become afraid, and they're afraid of how big the world is and how much stuff there is to do, and they're afraid, they're hiding because of their nakedness in the midst of a, of a big, vast creation. And so this, this thing of being set in natural elements has a long history in Jewish thought, especially waters. Uh, he leads me beside still waters. Uh, you know, uh, and, and the stories in the Old Testament about Leviathan and, and creating, oh, you know, God's face God's spirit moved over the face of the waters when God was creating. Waters are symbolic for Jewish folks in terms of their religious faith. I'd say they're, they're symbolic for us too. When we read this story of Jesus walking on water, calming the storm, we read that symbolically. Oh, God can come to me and calm the storms in my life too, right? And so we have this symbolic like water storms are chaotic, are bad, and God comes to us and calms it. And so that's a Jewish Hebrew thing that's present in Mark. It's amped up here um, uh, because he's particularly Jewish. Matthew really sort of clings to some of that Jewish stuff here. Uh, also in this story that comes up that has to do with this Jewish and Hebrew issue is when Jesus puts them into the boat and tells them to go over to the other side, they're no longer going to be in Jewish, uh, in strongly Jewish enclaves of people. They're going to be in what is likely much more Gentile uh, villages, land, areas, uh, people. All right. So for Jewish folks to, to venture outside is scary. And so there's this boundary water idea that they're going uh, from what's comfortable and Jesus puts them in the boat. And, and remember, this is on the heels of the, fi of the feeding of the 5,000. Hey, I'm I have great abundance. I can feed you. I can feed you, I can guide you, I can keep you, uh, I'll, and, and then put you in, and now go outside, and I'll, you have enough provision, you have enough sustenance. This is like being sent from the communion table. I give you a little piece of bread and a little shot of wine, and I say this will keep you through the whole week. Uh, and that's, that's sort of uh, theological based on uh, what Jesus is doing here. This is a story about going to outsiders. This is a story about being pushed 
This is a story about boundaries and broken boundaries, right? So what's significant here in terms of that Matthew and Mark setting next to each other is where Mark uses the word immediately, Matthew cleans it up. When Matthew tells those stories that Mark tells, he often takes immediately out. He does not do it here, uh, but he usually does. And there's another little twist on what Matthew does when he takes Mark's stories. Mark uh, has a certain way of talking about the disciples, and it is distinctly different than the way Matthew talks about the disciples. In Mark chapter 8, the disciples have no faith. They cannot see, they cannot perceive, they are hard of heart. You know, Jesus can walk on water and they are, have zero faith. You have no faith. Uh, and Jesus talks about how they do not see, they do not perceive, they have hard hearts. They're basically worthless, which makes you wonder, you know, what's God up to at all? And if they're so worthless, how did the story get to us? You know, how did Mark know to make a gospel if the people who told him the story were so bad? But that's the way Mark tells it. It's about God and what God does, uh, and less about what people do. Matthew changes that. Matthew might have picked up on the storytelling technique of, hey, if we're making these guys out to be this stupid, uh, should we even listen to their story? Uh, I don't know if that's why Matthew does it. In part, Matthew probably wants to clean this up because Matthew has some confidence in the skills people have. And this story of walking, Peter walking on water, Jesus walking on and in the boat, and Peter coming out of the boat, is a story about uh, how incapable the disciples are and how incapable that all of us are without God's care, without God's giving us our gifts and our resources. That's a very Mark story. When Matthew takes it, he, he knows, I think, that he really can't fix it and make the disciples look like who they're supposed to look like. But Matthew has this trick. Inside the New Testament, the term little faith is said, the word for that, is printed six times in the New Testament. It's five times in Matthew, and one of those five times is in this story. So little faith, you of little faith, is, is written in the New Testament six times. It's five times in Matthew, so he loves this phrase. One of them comes up in this text, and that juxtaposes itself up against uh, Mark, who talks about the disciples as no faith, can't see, can't perceive, have hard hearts. Well, Matthew says you have little faith, right? And to me, this is about identity. And this is about the boundaries of identity. It's about responsibility. It's about capabilities. It's like Buzz Lightyear, who doesn't think he's a toy. He thinks he's a legit space ranger. Um, to me, this is a story about being who God makes us. That we are basically the hard-hearted ones. Uh, we're the ones who have no faith. Uh, or in Matthew's terms, we're the ones who, I guess, have a, a mustard seed of faith, which Matthew says is enough. Um, so be who God made you. Live where God set you. Uh, Jesus put the disciples in the boat immediately after the five, feeding of the 5,000. God said, I, I can provide miraculously for you and for everybody when your faith is in me you can hit the boundary waters you can hit the storms and you can even get to scary outside places and you live in confidence of me but obviously this is a story about questioning our place when the storm hits uh, jesus puts the disciples into the boat and peter decides that he's not going to stay where the disciples are they have no confidence in where jesus has put them and Peter himself is just like, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, right? So this addresses the, the, the human condition of wanting to be space rangers and not really be who we are and not really live where we are. And although we lay down, like when the toy, you know, when Andy's coming, we lay down. I mean, we know the rules of the world around us and we behave according to them. We most often do the same simultaneous thing where we want to be space rangers. We want to have that next thing instead of the thing that we have. We believe that God is all about the, the, the feeding of the 5,000 and not the um, taking care of us in the boundary waters, in the chaotic sea, in the midst of these scary big things that we may or may not understand. This is a story about wanting to be space rangers, uh, but that we should just be who we are. When, when Matthew says you have little faith, 
that is not, to me, a derogatory claim. Remember, Mark said the disciples have no faith. To have little faith is a huge improvement. And Matthew is basically saying, you are who you are, you have enough faith, God has given you that. Stay where you are, that's what faith is. Sit at the boundary waters if that's where life has you, and be there and be who you are. Okay? So that to me is what this story is about. Uh, there is added anxiety, added stress here, uh, because ultimately this is about the people who are going to read this story. It's about the trip to the outsiders. And that's important because churches, gatherings of humans, people of faith, uh, we, we like it when it's a talk about what God does for us. But we have real difficulty when we want to flip that switch from what God does for us to what God is doing for the whole world. And that's that boundary water here. And when this storm hits, we want to make it all about us instead of what God sets us in the midst of. This is all just a big, long, complicated talk with you. Uh, and I need to hear this myself, by the way. But it's a talk between you and I about being who God made us. That we have little faith that God sets us in circumstances in life and there's a real power to um, proclaiming God by being who we are by embracing that and by uh, just saying well these gifts came from God I'll use them to the best of my ability we're not trying to have mucho faith we're fine with little faith and that's who we are and if this is in the midst of a storm uh, what we're called to do is stay in the boat and be who we are and that sounds so easy. Uh, in truth, we seldom do this. We seldom, maybe almost never, live like we're fine with who we are. And that's what this, to me, is a story. Um, we only need a little bit of faith. Matthew's already told us that. Uh, you know, when the two fish and the five loaves come forward, that's only a little bit. And God takes that and does these big things. Uh, when the mustard seed is planted or sown, when any of these seeds are sown, it's tiny. So God has given us this seed, it's tiny, that's all we need. And, and what we do as humans is totally lose sight of that. We live in America where everything is like, buy this super duper brand new Alamanooper great toothpaste. Uh, and it's terrific, the best toothpaste ever. And, uh, you know, we, we feel like we have to make more, be more, have better super duper stuff. And uh, we do that to ourselves and our giftedness and our satisfaction with who God has made us. And so this is a story about this very old, old, old uh, problem of chaos and how when chaos hits us, what we tend to do is rely on ourselves instead of be who God made us. Uh, sometimes chaos hits to, to strengthen in us who God made us, to remind us of who God made us. Maybe it's meant to get us to be happy for the boat. Uh, and then, you know, here's Peter who's trying to get out of it. You know, when, whenever what the storm is really supposed to do is make you happy you're in a boat and not, not in a boat. So, you know, there's a lot here. At the tail end of this, uh, Matthew adds a piece that Mark does not have when he tells this story. So Mark adds this confession of who Jesus is because he can walk on water. And Matthew adds this part about them worshiping. So he's added that they have little faith. He's, he's infinite, you know, infinitely increased the faith from zero to a little bit. And then he increases what, what they accomplish through this whole story and that it leads to worship. They all end up in the boat together, which is where God put them to begin with. And they end up worshiping. Uh, and this storm is calmed, so there's some... Hey, I'm the, I have providence over creation. I set you where I set you. Uh, and it's enough to be where you are. That is, uh, in and of itself, you know, you would stop listening to these videos if every week it was the exact same content. But to be honest, it should be this same content every week. Hey, just be who God made you. Uh, that's what this story is about. Stay in the boat. Uh, it's it's all a big symbolic sort of analogy of when storms hit you don't you don't solve the anxiety of a storm by talking about all the stuff uh, that you need you survive it by just sort of hunkering down and being who God made you we don't proclaim who God is very well 
by always telling him that we need more, telling people we need more stuff and looking like consumers just like everybody else. The way that we proclaim our faith is that it's grounded in this confidence that we're provided for. And that's so different that when we say that, it's a proclamation of confidence in who God is, makes us. We're okay that we're toys in the story. You know, that we're, 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 we're not worried about space rangering it. We're just worried about being the best space ranger toy we can be, all right? So that's sort of what that's all uh, getting at there. Um, inside of this, there is also this other little sort of teeny piece uh, about, about courage or bravery. And if you look those up in like a thesaurus, those two words seem similar. What's the difference between courage and bravery? You know, how, how, how c courageous is um, Buzz Lightyear or how full of bravado is he? Those are two different things. Jesus says, take heart, that's be courageous, that's a sort of confidence in who you are, and uh, that's, that's enough. God's saying that's enough. Take heart. Courage is heartedness. Uh, courage is a reminder of who God says you are and letting that be enough. Bravado is putting this whole layer over the top of it, like, uh, to infinity and beyond, I'm not a toy, I'm a real legit space ranger, and I'm brave enough to jump and to fly and to fall and to, I'm brave enough to fight Zerg and you know that's sort of bravado and that is uh, this layer we put on top of it that's Peter getting out of the boat he's brave he's full of bravado but the courage idea is where uh, hey you only needed to be courage here and it's about finding our identity it's about finding our uh, our our spot in the story the sermon probably takes off from that pretty heavily. Uh, the, the idea of you don't have to be up here, but you shouldn't be down here. And that there's this place where God claims us and sets us, this sort of middle ground. And being the middle ground well, faithfully, confident in who God made us, is the totality. It's not, you don't move off of it with bravado. You don't move back on it by, you know, uh, disparaging yourself. And so courage is taking heart, it's centering down in, well, God gave me A, B, and C, and you fill in the blank of those, and, and, and not coming off of it. So, so what, what we all tend to do is we tend to search, we tend to look, we tend to buy, we tend to want, we tend to look ahead of us and say, hey, I'm not really a toy, I'm, I'm, I'm an actual space ranger. Faith is living in enough confidence that little faith is enough, that God gave us enough, and that we don't have to be space rangers. We get to be moms and dads or grandmas and grandpas or members of a congregation or brothers and sisters or parts of a community or, or who we are, and that being who we are faithfully is, is enough. And when we move off of little faith into bravado is when the sinking and the mess happens, right? It's uh, this idea that God and God alone already gave us enough faith, already made us who we are, and it's living confidently in that we are worth Christ's coming to in the midst of storms, Christ cares for us, God gives us everything we need, and this is a hard place to live. We usually want to get out of the boat. We usually want to be bravado, I'm too good for this, or you know, uh, I'm too scared, or whatever. This is about wherever you're set, whatever relationships you have, and how you conduct those prayerfully, faithfully, that's enough. Be good at who you are, because who you are is who God made you. All right, so that's the, uh, well, that's the, the sort of noise going on out the window, and that's also the preparing for Sunday. Uh, so thanks for joining me again. I hope you learned a little bit about the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I hope you stay safe. And I look forward to seeing you Sunday. See you soon.